being here today to be able to talk with you all and learn from, from everybody else as well. It's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, so I'm with USGS and um, stationed up at the Glacier Field Station. Um, and uh, <coughs> Brian sent me his presentation uh, that he gave at this a couple years ago. And so um, I freely borrowed from that with his permission. And so I uh, added him here too. So um, there, there's a few slides that I know uh, a very little about, and those are all, uh, if you have questions about those, I'll um, refer to that. But what we wanted to basically go over here today is just um, landscape genetics, um, what it is, why it's important, and sort of some uh, kind of an overview of some of the common approaches, especially a few particular options for using genetic data to inform landscape management, since that's a uh, Kind of, at least that's why I got into it, is, is to try to be able to answer applied management questions. And also to discuss what we know a little bit about the pros and cons of some of these different options. Um, so before there was actually this, this field called landscape genetics, there was many other fields. And so landscape genetics is really a combination of landscape ecology, where we have these interactions between spatial patterns and ecological processes. And I'm going to refer back to this concept of patterns and processes um, several times because I think really a lot of what we're doing now with genomic data is also trying to find the pattern, you know, you find the outlier. That's a pattern, it's not necessarily process, but we're trying to connect it with processes. And so um, there's, a, there's a similarity there that I see. It's where you, where you start is trying to identify the pattern. Um, and population genetics, which of course was a more quantitative uh, field where really they're trying to assess these four main evolutionary processes in a quantitative sense. Um, but to do that, to be able to do the math, particularly at its, uh, from its origins, there had to be a lot of simplification. Um, so we now have a lot more techniques available to us, and I'll talk a little bit about this. So I came at this um, learning about landscape genetics from the perspective of working on grizzly bears. Um, we've been working on them since about 2000. And um, particularly when it came to, I started working with uh, Kate Kendall, who you guys met last, uh, yesterday, or most of you did anyway. Um, and from the perspective of, of thinking a lot about spatial patterns and how do we actually try to deal with, with what we see with the bears. So we have, in this system, in the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem, we have these bears that live in a heterogeneous landscape. Um, they have a more continuous distribution across the landscape than a lot of the population models where you have these really discrete, isolated subpopulations that are island-like. Um, and of course, it's really difficult and expensive to obtain data. Um, and of course, with, with any animal that's uh, listed as threatened, it's especially difficult to use any kind of experimental approach to actually get at the causative piece of it, the pro causes of the process that we're most interested in. And grizzly bears aren't alone by any means. Um, these characteristics are shared by a lot of different species, and I'm sure a lot of you are working on species <coughs> that have similar challenges. Um, but these kinds of reasons are part of why uh, landscape genetics seem like the way to go. So um, this is where we're at. Here's the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem. The red is the, the grizzly bear recovery uh, area. The yellow is uh, actually it's the, the distribution from 2004, I think. Um, so I think Kate talked to you about this system. That's where the population estimate that she did was. And then she also talked to you about the cabinet yak, which is actually these two separate populations. Um, and so what we have, I mean, you could, you could think of these as islands, but within these, um, islands, it's actually very heterogeneous. We have a lot of different things going on inside of them. Um, and one of the challenging things in terms of uh, thinking about land management, particularly land management between these populations, is that there's nothing there to sample. And so we inherently have these issues with uh, sampling. So what landscape genetics does is basically explicitly quantify the effects of landscape composition and configuration on gene flow. So it's really a spatially explicit uh, field. And it does that through using individual-based approaches, so not looking at just the population level, but the individual-based level, to try to examine these patterns and then infer processes at a really fine spatial resolution. Um, and these landscape features influence gene flow through dispersal, oftentimes reduced dispersal, and very local fitness, which we which we've been talking about in terms of genomics. Um, and the main sort 
sort of goal in terms of landscape genetics, or one of them, is to be able to identify corridors and barriers on the landscape uh, with a really, really high spatial resolution in order to either um, maintain, promote, or limit connectivity between populations, usually. But also to keep, keep a single population together. And we do this for a couple of reasons. One of the big ones is to try to understand um, uh, how to prevent disease transmission. So this is a paper from 2008 about chronic wasting disease in white-tailed deer in, in uh, Wisconsin. And basically what they did is, is they looked at uh, pairs of, of areas and they compared FSTs and did a kind of a linear regression to try to evaluate what was influencing um, the, the distance, the genetic distance between these uh, groups of individuals. And what they found here was that there's, there was a difference in the disease um, and based on these, these highways, so it was lower in those areas. <coughs> In this area, bighorn sheep is a big issue um, in terms of these are very small populations. A lot, a lot of them are 100 individuals or fewer. And we, we're having a lot of die-offs um, from pneumonia uh, complexes. Um, so this is just one example from this year, this spring. Basically 100 individuals. And when this was published, they'd already lost 90 um, sheep. And they, I guess they had 110 individuals. They only had 18 left. So one of the data sets that I'm, that I'm working up right now is a, a bighorn sheep data set up in Glacier Park. Um, and it's, it's kind of fun um, in terms of we have a lot of different kinds of data to work with. So we have uh, GPS telemetry data from 95 different individuals. Um, based on that, uh, my collaborator, Kim Keating, uh, has identified several different social groups, um, 15 different groups of females, eight different groups of rams that do not overlap in space or time. Um, uh, Gordon uh, contributed to some early work where we uh, had a little bit of genetic data here and a little bit of genetic data up there and found genetic structure. We now have newer data that we can look at that with. And then we also have pathogen data. Um, and this is one of the pathogens where it basically doesn't exist here, but it does exist here. And so this is important in terms of disease transmission. Um, this one doesn't, didn't make it down here. Will, what will happen in the future? Is there anything, if, the, if this is a real dividing line, is there something that we can recommend in terms of management to maintain that if there's another disease epidemic that comes through? Mm -hmm. um, another project is um, trying to understand brucellosis in elk um, down in the Yellowstone system. And so Brian worked a lot on this project um, in combination with Gordon and a colleague of mine, Paul Cross. Um, and again, basically, you're trying to understand. So brucellosis Bruce Bruce is down here. Um, is it going to expand, and what's the rate of expansion? And how, did, how is that influenced by the landscape? Now, of course, the other side of that, um, in terms of not trying to disrupt a disease spread, is actually trying to reconnect or um, keep different populations connected. Um, and so we have a lot of effects that are going on. These probably aren't new to you, but uh, major road systems and deforestation are both some, some big issues that a lot of wildlife uh, populations are facing. So again, going to the grizzly bears, we have, this is kind of what we have right now. Um, and one of the questions we have, is there a way to reconnect these populations and particularly to rescue um, or to maintain these populations that over here that are really small. Ideally, we'd kind of like to have them be connected in a way, um, not where we have to actually transplant them, continue to augment them and move them over, but where they're actually doing that naturally. And so as we have this expanding population here, so it went from 2004 into, in the year 2004, 765 individuals, we now think it's up around uh, 960 individuals and it's probably expanded from a number, um, actually one sort of largest population and potentially a couple smaller subpopulations down in the south end that has some limited gene flow to being a much healthier uh, system. So uh, one of the things I've been really interested in is can we use the information inside of this really fairly large population to try to inform what we do between populations. <coughs> so, 
given that connectivity is this, is this sort of big focus of landscape genetics, I thought it might be useful to go back and just tell you about how corridor plants are actually developed um, so that you can kind of see how the genetics piece of it fits in and informs that corridor planting process. So what usually happens is that you first start off and you have to choose the places that you want to connect. So this is kind of, um, <coughs> this is actually the area between uh, the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem and uh, the Cabinet Yak. Um, so the cabinet's here below <coughs> Highway 2 and the uh, Yak is up above Highway 2. And these are um, lands that are public um, with a few inholdings and, and some random um, disturbance kinds of things. Um, so this is a uh, study that was done, uh, I think it got published recently, by um, Mike Proctor, who's a colleague out of, uh, out of BC. Then the second thing that happens is you get to think about what variables you might want to uh, that might be influencing animal movement and survival. Um, so thinking about bears, this is just a couple of random examples, whether uh, berries are present or absent, um, and whether uh, meadow, whether forest is present or absent, um, just as a very simplified kind of an example. And so when you're thinking about your own systems, um, really you can think about any Thing that you can map. And so those two examples I just gave you are both habitat kind of features, but you're not restricted to that with these kinds of methods. You can use um, anything that you can map. And so um, I'm going to talk a little bit later about using population density as a, as a factor. Um, but you can use predator, uh, sort of thinking about predator prey, you might think about prey density. Um, you can use uh, disease prevalence. Lots of, there's lots of uh, different things that you might be able to map that might be relevant. The next step of this is to basically try to um, quantify what's the effect of this landscape. So um, there's a lot of different ways to do this, um, but if you think about it in kind of a, a single um, effect of a single feature at once, all of, just a single one by itself, um, you might think that, okay, we're very uh, presence is where they are not present, um, there's basically no effect, so, or just an effect of isolation by distance, so it has a value of one. Um, and where they're absent, maybe that's a, a resistance of five, so it's five times more difficult to move through the area where berries, or, the or bears might be five times less likely to move through an area where berries are absent than when they're present. Um, and you might actually have some variables that might be even more resistant. Yeah, go for it. How do you actually quantify the bears? We're going to get into that. <laughs> I'm going to go through the process first, and I'm going to go back into that because that's the hard part. <laughs> I, th I think it's hard. I spent a whole PhD thinking about it. So <laughs> um, and then basically, you have to figure out, you know, so you might think about it's easier to think about these one at a time, and then you have to combine them somehow. So you can think about these as costs. Um, that's kind of the a simple way to think about it, but depending what uh, uh, what sort of data you're using, this cost might reflect movement. So, if you think about telemetry data, you might be you might be defining cost as based on movement. If you're thinking about genetic data, it might be something more like your ability to survive and disperse. And then finally, <coughs> you figure out what routes between a couple of wildland blocks actually minimize the cost. Of and so that's how you figure out what, and prioritize what lands you might want to conserve between, between populations. And there's a, several different ways to do that. Um, least cost paths and corridors are basically trying to find a route that is the cheapest for an animal to disperse through. Um, you can also do, there's also other approaches using individual simulations that, um, where you might retain the simulations that reach, reach the other side and, and look at the probability of those making it there. Um, for cost distance metrics, I don't know if you've talked about this earlier in the week, but I'll, I'll go over this really quickly. Um, so we think a lot about geographic distance or Euclidean distance, isolation by distance. That's just, you know, um, calculate, calculate your distance using the, uh, the uh, x squared, uh, y squared, um, that equation. <laughs> um, 
So there's no, basically, if you have this going on, you're kind of assuming that there's no ecological effect, that there's no effect of the landscape. But when you want to try to incorporate the effect of the landscape, um, you kind of use different ways to weight the landscape features. Um, and the most common one is this least cost distance built by Andreessen et al. in, I think it was 2000, okay. I don't know about the year, that's not right. Um, it's been around for a long time, <laughs> we'll just say that. Um, and so what you do, basically with least cost distance, if this is your origin, and you can think of the light green here as each, each, each spot is a distance unit, um, and you might think the light green is cheap to move across, and so it's only $2 per unit, so if you move three distance units, you multiply that by two, and so the whole cost of moving that distance is just $6. If you move it in the other direction, and this, green, this dark green is more expensive, say $20, um, and then you have one unit that's still $2, then the whole cost of that is $42. And it might actually be cheaper to go across, go around a different way, go around the obstacle. Right, so it's the same thing if I were going to walk across the room. I probably wouldn't go over the tables. I'd go around. Much simpler. So, so that's the least cost path. For me to go to the back of the room, it'd be to go through the middle there, wherever there's not a table. The table would be high cost. And so this approach basically kind of assumes that the species uh, can has some sort of knowledge of the best path. So it would assume that I'm not actually just blindly walking into um, the table that I can see the table, and in fact I can see that table and I can see the one in the back of the room. Um, and so what it might look like if you calculate it from, let's just say this is a, a particular origin, um, you can calculate the distance going out from it in any direction based on these landscapes, based on this resistance uh, cost and surface. Um, the other thing to think about with, with these cost path mm -hmm. approaches or really any distance approach, is that by itself, um, there's no sort of uh, cutoff that says that whatever path that you're choosing, what, you know, what distance is, is, is that distance short enough for an animal to actually make it there? Or a piece of pollen or, or whatever, fish, whatever you're working with. An alternative metric of distance um, is based on circuit theory, and it's called resistance distance. Um, and basically it treats movement and dispersal more like an electrical circuit. And um, what happens is that if you have more paths, you have more circuits, then the total resistance is reduced. And so that's kind of saying, okay, there's many different ways that an individual could get from here to the back of the room. Um, so right now there's actually only one for me to easily get to the back of the room. But if we had more, more people could go, or more animals, whatever you want to call it, to get there at the same time because there's, there's more paths. So it's kind of based on that um, theory, which many people find more suitable for the species that they're working with. So this is kind of assuming that animals don't have a very far distance perception of the landscape, and instead um, they're moving fairly randomly just based on whatever's closest to them. Um, and part of this, part of the, so this is actually, you can't use this by itself. Um, to create a corridor, but you can use it as a distance metric, so you can still say what's the distance here, but you can't use it to identify the least cost um, because it incorporates the multiple paths. But what it's really nice for is you can highlight sort of pinch points. So um, in this particular example, you can see that it kind of the probability of animals moving through there is really high here, and so that's kind of a pinch point, or over here. And so when you're thinking about land use management, you might think about um, you know, uh, that might be a good place to make sure that there's a, a crossing across that road or whatever it's going across. Go ahead. Do you find it accurate though for small distances? Uh, I, I, I find it difficult to believe that there are so many corridors for the animals to go there when it's like 10 meters. I mean, yeah, it's one path. Mm -hmm. I cannot make circles and circles and circles. Yeah, and I think, um, I don't think it's, uh, it's not saying that they're, is only one, so the least cost path approach says there's only one path, it just uses the one that's cheapest. You can do it as a least cost corridor by saying it has to be wider. Um, and the circuit, um, it treats, you know, if you think about this whole landscape as being made up of a, of a raster like you would have in, in GIS, does everybody follow that terminology? Um, so like a grid, um, so you split it up 
and there's a cell here and a cell here and a cell here and a cell here. And so if you if you just kind of cut this up in boxes and each one was a, a unit, um, the the circuit theory doesn't is, doesn't restrict you to having one path. It, is, it instead allows you to have many paths. And so it's not saying that an animal will go all of these different places. It's just saying it can go any of these places. Does that make sense? We can talk more too if you want later. Um, well, and I would just say that in my experience with this theory, you have to really know your species yeah. and, and scale it to your species. I, I just found a really big part to use it when the area I was working on was small. Yeah. So well, I, I guess the resolution to your raster. Yeah. 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 yeah, there is a resolution, and, and you know how. You know, so for when, when I work on this kind of stuff for grizzly bears, you know, I don't, I don't usually look at it at a super fine resolution. I look at it at a, a half a kilometer scale because that's so the, the grid size that I'm I'm looking at is pretty big because you can't basically, and, and otherwise it will take forever to run. Also, yeah. so um, whenever you're um, using circuit theory, Circuitscape is the program that you can pull this in with, and um, yeah, it's. It, it's an uh, exponentially longer process if you have more cells. So these are just a couple of the programs to calculate these different kinds of distance. So um, one from University of Montana with uh, Brian Hand and Aaron Landgut is a uh, core. Inside of R, there's a G distance, um, which is also based on a package called IGRAPH. Um, and then you can also figure out these class paths in ArcGIS, but it's not necessarily very conducive to incorporating into modeling. Um, and then Circuitscape, there's a it's a software package, and you can you can call that from R or other software as well. So I just thought I'd um, this is a, from Brian's work, and it just kind of shows you a comparison of these different metrics. So so again, with the least cost path, you're only defining a simple a single path, or perhaps two paths, uh, a couple paths between different places, um, and then. The, with the circuit theory kind of approach, it's it's more of a network and, and it does a better job in terms of allowing you to, uh, when there's sort of a lot of area that's not too bad to move through, accounting for that. So now to go back to this resistance per pixel thing. Um, so and the, the resist, these resistances in this resistance map, I mean, everything's based on that. And so you can, you can create that in a lot of different ways. And so there's a paper by um, Kathy Zeller that came out in 2012 that just sort of looked at what, how people were creating these resistance maps. Um, and it turns out that um, at that point in time, there were still a lot of people just using expert opinion. And that's because this is hard. <laughs> it's expensive to collect data, of course, any time. Um, and the best kinds of data to collect can be the most expensive. And so, um, you know, there's many approaches in genetics is one of them. And so I'm good because this is a genetics focused workshop, I'm going to talk about that. Um, oh yeah, one key point about that is that only three studies out of all the ones that she surveyed actually used independent empirical data sets to both create and then test the resistance surface. And so, um, that's a key thing and it's a, it's a really good tool if you're able to actually validate um, your work with a second type of data or a second data set of any kind. So we really have kind of two ways that genetics can inform corridor planning. Um, and gene flow, this is probably the most commonly used way. Um, and that's of course a result of the movement of genes across the landscape. It's a, it's a complex process really. I mean, You've probably ta been talking about it all this week, um, but you have movement of individuals to mate when you're thinking about it kind of from the individual perspective. You have the mating process, and so you have Mendelian inheritance there. Um, and these are all; these can all be um, written as a statistical uh, process. So you can write an equation for any of these. Um, you have a movement of dispersing individuals, and then you have survival, and of course, um, acting on survival, you you can have a selection influencing survival and the number of individuals in a population influencing drift. Um, the second 
approach or the second way you can kind of use genetics is through dispersal. And I'm going to talk about that. It's, a pro it's what I ended up doing with the grizzly bears here, or am doing actually, um, and using a parentage approach. But first, to kind of talk about uh, gene flow, um, there's sort of two approaches to try to quantify, to get back to your question, to try to quantify those resistances. Um, and one is based more on significance testing, and the other approach is, is really trying to use correlations and trying to optimize those. So when you're doing significance testing, um, you start off with these hypotheses that are very explicit. Um, and so the way these work is, is thinking about, first of all, there's no distance effect. Um, you might have isolation by distance. You could have a barrier, or you could have landscape resistance of the type I've been showing you. Um, and this barrier um, idea is really kind of a subset of the landscape resistance idea. So um, people refer to this as isolation by resistance as well. So as you're reading the literature, you might come across that. And so it's basically, you know, so how different are individuals and how is that influenced by the landscape? It's trying to tie those together. Um, and usually what happens is in this landscape resistance piece of it, it's not just one hypothesis, instead it's a whole slew of hypotheses. So how about different variables and also those weights of the variables. Um, but in a really simple sense, so this is from a, a study by Mike Schwartz um, on wolverines, and this is uh, snow. And this is one of the resistance surfaces that uh, they thought would be important to wolverines. And so you can think, so they have these values, the resistance or cost, these weights that I've been talking about. <clears throat> and then the geographic distance would just be this simple metric, you know, how far away is that? You can calculate that easily. And then the ecological least cost path then, in this case where we have ones where there's snow, it's going to be across here. And you can calculate that too, basically by adding up the values. When is one? Otherwise you can <coughs> So the way this, uh, this test, that what they're basically trying to do is it uses something called the partial Mantel test um, that's really on mm -hmm. correlations between the ecological and genetic distances. So um, it's a partial mm -hmm. test because what you do first uh, is you take just one, one of these things, either the Euclidean or geographic distance, and the least cost path, relate it to genetic distance, and then take the residual and relate it to the other one. And then you look at the whole set of, um, of significance tests. So within this, um, again, it's not just a single hypothesis. You're usually trying different things. So, so um, you might look at that forest, in this case, might have a resistance of 20. But you might also compare that with it having a resistance of 40, or a resistance of 30, or a resistance of 100. And of course, each time you do that, it's um, you're trying to, you can treat those as alternative hypotheses. Um, so this is what the set of significant tests look like um, in terms of when it's supported that there is a landscape influence. So that genetic distance is as it relates to landscape the resistance surface that, that you're testing is significant, um, that it's still significant when you've already partialed out the effect of landscape, uh, I'm sorry, effect of uh, just isolation by distance, and then um, it's not significant uh, when you remove this first. So then what people do is they, they use the Mantel test to compare hypotheses and a different range, there's kind of actually quite a large range of methods to identify the best of the landscape resistance values. Um, and these have been really widely used, um, but they've been criticized pretty broadly too um, for having high type 1 errors, which is of course the false positive landscape effect, for being just kind of a, a crude tool. So again, it's a, it's a correlation. Um, sometimes that's not as satisfying in terms of actually getting at the process that's behind it as we might like. Um, and then there's also this, this thing that Robin mentioned where we're, there's this focus on the significance testing versus really kind of getting down deep into the biological effect size of importance. Um, so there's a whole slew of papers that, that talk about that. 
And um, when I started to get into this, I was working with a statistician, and I was very frustrated by the uh, how long it took actually to <laughs> do this approach um, in terms of if you have a lot of ideas about a lot of variables and a lot of potential values for your resistance surface. And so um, I worked with the statistician and we developed a, a nonlinear regression algorithm um, to try to make it faster and more efficient. And so I'll, I'll go through that in just a second, um, but Brian has also developed a different algorithm, a genetic algorithm that he calls GARN, um, that does a very similar thing. So these are both automating the search to try to quantify these resistance values. Um, again, so causal modeling, you're testing multiple values, and the way you can think about that is, um, so this is sort of an underlying uh, likelihood model. Uh, it's a picture of likelihood. So if you have two uh, resistance variables, um, so again, say just maybe uh, berry presence, absence, and forest, and you have a potential value for each one of those, um, each intersection here is a potential set of values, and if you calculate all of those, which I did in this case, um, after three weeks of high high performance computing, <laughs> you get a surface like this that tells you what the likelihood surface actually looks like. Um, so we didn't want to do that, but that's basically what you're doing when you're when you're taking that causal modeling approach and saying each one of these um, guesses is a um, each one of these is a hypothesis. So I have to calculate this over and over again. Um, and so instead, what we wanted to do is use existing algorithms to try to just find where the peak is, so the most likely values for those. And so what we did is we just turned those into an equation. Um, this is a simplification of one, but it's just a very straightforward example, so you can kind of see we have a coefficient, um, just like linear regression. Yeah, um, could you do it, like, for instance, the same in the same way, but you do, like, a RDA, like, kind of analysis, and do a partial RDA, like, with all your your parameters, like, uh, Probably. And, I mean, it's like you do it at the mm -hmm. one that explains the most, like your axis, like your know, genetic variation, and like that you have already used this kind of. Like I'm sure that you, yeah, I'm sure that you could. Sure. I'd have to think about a little bit how to actually make it happen. But yeah, it's basically, you're basically using a program to sort of do, do this search to find the, yeah, to most find the best, like, like, the best thing was, more quickly. I mean, because it's, uh, it seems very time consuming. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that, so I was like, I just don't want to spend all my time getting you know. Yeah. And so, so this is, you know, it's kind of a computer science uh, problem, but it's also kind of a, this optimization, I mean, there's a whole field of optimization. And, you know, I know this much about it, and there, but there's people that devote their whole careers to studying optimization. And um, so this is a very well established one in R, which is why I used it. Um, and you can, I can use, uh, it's flexible enough to allow me to do a lot of nonlinear, to make this be a nonlinear equation that encompass the range of variables and, and relationships that I thought were, were important in this case. Okay. Do you ever, um, so you have to have an optimality criterion here. Do you ever actually let the animals give you the optimality criterion by tracking them and see where they go through the landscape and have that inform the model? That would be a different approach, yeah. So then, in that case, you wouldn't be using this genetic distance. So in here, I'm, I'm basically comparing the genetic distance here with this resistance distance. Over no, but to get the again. resistance distance, you could actually inform it from where the animals go and the kind of landscape that they go through. Mm -hmm. That would, that would, and you could use the GA to. Like an habitat Yeah. So people, people do use uh, habitat selection models as one way of creating resistances. Okay. And that would be one way to, um, to like if you were gonna actually fit this in a Bayesian sort of approach, you could put that in as a prior, for example. Or people actually just use it. They just, that's just their resistance surface and they just roll with it, so. Um, Gordon? I just wanna make a comment that might help some people conceptually. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, allows detecting many, many hundreds of thousands or hundreds of thousands of resistance surfaces, and that hasn't been done before, it hasn't been 
Canada did it, and Tim Bryan got that software that allows you to do it. But in, in that situation, uh, if you don't have all the many possible existing services that might be best explain their genetic data, you might find one that fits well. Yeah, and so um, so what Bird's referring to, yeah, I, th I think that is true. And so we, you know, basically you're only you could only be searching a tiny portion of the of the likelihood. And you know, and, and in here I'm only actually I only actually did a tiny portion of the likelihood. So this surface goes probably down here and it probably goes out here, you know, and, and maybe if I did everything it would actually look like this and have this is what you'd like is it for it to have one nice peak. Um, it doesn't always do that, but but that's maybe what you'd like. And so, so this is, it's kind of a, it's kind of actually fairly, um, you know, not in genetic stuff because genetic, the distance piece of it actually makes it, um, the fact that you're working with the distance actually makes um, some of it very complex. But, but uh, yeah, by itself, that's a, that's a, this is an advance. And um, the fact that this surface looks smooth and continuous is a good thing because then, if you're using an algorithm, you can actually find the peak, and it's not as likely to get stuck in a in a little peak, um, which can happen with some of the, the structure algorithms, for example. Um, that can happen. So when um, uh, John was talking about um, when you didn't, I can't remember who it was who had the issue with the convergence or multiple. Somebody over here was talking about uh, multiple different solutions. Uh, underlying it, the, the likelihood there was two peaks. So what if it's on the z-axis there, and how does that relate to the likelihood? So in this case, I, the, the, the criterion I'm optimizing is actually not the likelihood, it's the Mantell correlation. Um, and so really, um, yeah, so depending on how you structure your optimization algorithm, you could be optimizing uh, the likelihood, which is what's usually done in maximum likelihood, um, or you could optimize <laughs> other criterions. And I was basically structuring this as the causal modeling approach was doing, it's sort of the it was sort of the the theory that was underneath what the the actions were. So unfortunately, um, so I did a whole bunch of simulations, and unfortunately, the the problem I found was that at least with all the simulations I did, and I did a very large number of them, is I could never get truth back out. So I'd start off with a simulation, I'd say the true resistance is this amount. I, simu I simulated it with the uh, CDPOP, which is an individual-based simulation program that accounts for all of those processes I talked about at the beginning, uh, movement to mate, movement to disperse, um, all of those things. Um, and I ended up finding that if, if I had a coefficient of 10, um, I'd, I'd end up having as much error, almost as much error um, as the value was for the coefficient. So really, really large errors. Um, and so in other words, uh, the Mantell correlation as a criterion <coughs> that you're trying to maximize is um, not very precise. So, um, and it's not very easy to get truth back out. And this, I think, um, has an important, really important uh, implications. Um, and also in those scenarios, um, I also found that the causal modeling approach rarely would support the true estimates um, in the simulations. So basically, you know, this is a whole bunch of simulations, but uh, I think the maximum one I found was 30%. Um, so it's pretty rare for them to actually support what was going on. Um, so for myself, I was I was fairly frustrated by that, um, and I'm gonna talk through the grizzly bear example a little bit, because I didn't just do the simulations, I also was working with this really large genetic grizzly bear data set. Um, to talk about. But, but basically, what I think is going on there, why the Mantell correlation oftentimes doesn't work very well, is because this is a lot of processes, you know? So um, there's a lot of error in any one of those, 
there's a lot of stochasticity in any one of those, and it's just a lot of processes. So you, you're taking a simple correlation and trying to use that correlation to explain all of these different processes. And it might just be not, not able to do it sometimes. Um, so I ended up going, thinking harder about the data that I had in this grizzly bear data set and looking at parentage analysis instead. Um, oh yeah, so here's the grizzly bear data set. And so just to show you an example of running through the Mantel um, optimization approach. So I took a couple of variables that, that we knew were important to grizzly bear movement. Um, road density has been implicated, so this is, uh, here's Glacier Park, um, here's flathead lakes that were down here somewhere. Um, Missoula's down here, uh, or down here. This is the Swan Valley. Uh, Swan Valley here is the Mission Mountains. Um, and then this is this is the habitat map. Um, so music and so riparian wet habitat and shrublands, which are really, <coughs> really important habitat types for grizzly bears. Um, and I use those and. The part of, part of my sort of disillusionment with, with Mantel correlations came about when I tried to do this, and I was getting models that were different, um, had different Mantel correlations, you know, all the way out to this, they were almost the same out to the fifth or sixth decimal point. And I was like, I don't know if that means anything biologically. Um, so for me, that was something that really um, worried me. Um, and even, you know, this is geographic only distance, so isolation by distance, and there's, it's out at the second uh, degree, so you only have 10% <coughs> difference in the correlation value, um, even for isolation by distance versus habitat. So, I mean, grizzly bears are generalist species, and they are able to move across a lot of different things, so, so maybe that's <coughs> a piece of it, um, a piece of the story. <coughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure I calculated the p-value actually, or I probably did, but um, but to me that's not it's not that interesting. So, but, but, um, like, I mean, the, the, the Mantel era, like, I mean, it's, it's, it's very hard, as you said, to interpret. Uh huh. But if you do, like, I don't understand uh, why you didn't do like maybe, maybe a simple linear model and like test for each model and like that you have adjusted elsewhere and we can know how many percent of the frequency variation is explained by your factors and this makes more sense. Well, so, so um, correlations are basically, in the simple sense, they are basically looking at the percent of variation that's explained. So so this is explaining 20% and that's explaining 22%. So it's like a magic answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's a little bit different because it's in space and so you're, there's this, cor there's additional correlation. So it's, it's not a direct interpretation. But if this were, I guess when it is a simple one, and it wasn't in space, that's how you could interpret it. And if you calculate, I mean, I can keep preparing you, like, you know, There's no love just, likelihood. Mm -hmm. So, so, um, so yeah. it's not really set up for that. So why you didn't, like, do an average, which allowed you to have a likelihood, and allowed you to just choose a model, and, like, explain your genetic variation with this model, and with all the different so the methodology to do that within the population um, didn't really, there wasn't really an obvious method to do that with when I was doing the studies, so. Do you think about doing this now? Um, well, I've been formed with this different approach, so um, that's not to say there isn't a method that can do that now. I don't know of any, but um, you all are doing a lot of reading on these things, and so you may be more familiar with some options, so. Um, I think I think it would be great if, if there is one. Um, so the data set this data set is is so I, I understand Kate didn't show you a lot of pictures uh, yesterday, but this is basically the 2004 data set. Um, so the hair traps were distributed across the state million acre study area. Those are the open circles, and then the closed circles are all the the rub tree. Um, and this is this picture is from the 2004 data set, but we have data from all of uh, Kate's studies here that she led, um, 98 to 2000, 2004, and then 09 to 12. <clears throat> and so what we did is we conducted a parentage analysis using our genetic data. So again, 24 uh, 
foci. Um, we had about, uh, in, the, in the final version, we have around 1,100 individual varices from Kate's data sets. I think this is going to be an iterative process based on um, our neighbors to the north. I can't remember who pointed it out. I think it was Robin who pointed out that, that um, this isn't really a separate population. The various extend up in the Canada. Um, so we're working on an uh, agreement to, to work with them on this project too. But um, when I first did this, uh, I used Parente, which is now very similar to service. Um, and in the intervening time, the parentage methods uh, have advanced quite a bit. And so we're now using Colony. And, um, Basically, what that's doing is accounting for the entire tree all at once um, in developing the, the family tree. And so in our system, we actually had a few areas where there was some inbreeding, and um, that caused problems in the, in the approach that parente or service takes, where you're only looking at pairwise um, comparisons, so a mom with its offspring. Colony is incorporating uh, sibship as well, and so it uh, reduces, actually eliminates a lot of those problems, and we have very high accuracy, um, or high, uh, high probability, high likelihoods um, of assignment, and I think we're going to end up with something around 450 triads um, from those, uh, from that data set, which is pretty, pretty good for dispersal. I'm pretty excited about it. And for bears, um, they spend their first couple of years with their moms. And so um, if we know where their mom is and we assume that, that she's still basically using the same area and we use the kid as the, the new place, um, we have a dispersal uh, movement. And so um, I spent some time developing this method based on uh, sort of seed dispersal. So again, there they already know the beginning location of the tree and the end location of the seedling. Um, and they use these distance kernels to model dispersal. And they started off with this really simple model of isotropic distance. Um, and then they've also expanded it to account for wind, which is anisotropic. Um, but what we're doing is actually a step more complicated because we don't think the bears just sort of fly off into space. We think they might move around the table. <laughs> Um, and so what we're doing, so what I did is, is basically take this, uh, uh, my, we can think about it in the, in the very simple case, um, if you don't have, if you have isolation by distance, the resistance service looks flat, um, and the likelihood of um, moving a certain distance would decrease for, for each individual. So this might be the number of bears here, it's just a histogram showing what distance they go out. Um, so again, from a certain origin, Euclidean distance looks basically the same in all directions, and you can get a likelihood by putting this down over the top of it, so changing it from being just a two-dimensional histogram into a three-dimensional um, equation. And then what we did was just we just replaced the D in there. Sorry, too many equations. There's a D in here, so it's just distance divided by sigma. That's that's basically the variance. So how how big is the spread there? Um, and then we just replaced uh, distance with this distance prime that's a function of the resistance surface. And so what it does is it, uh, here's, here's the case I just showed you where you have isolation by distance, which was kind of our null model. And then we have um, where landscape has an effect and this alpha parameter shifts this around. And so instead of being a smooth surface, you might be more likely to move, it costs less to move in some directions than others. So you could effectively move further to here than to here because it's cheaper to move in that direction. Does that make sense? So then when you put the likelihood over the top of that, it, it changes the shape of that. So um, you're more likely to move to these places that are closer to the center than far away. And um, we're likely to move here uh, here then, well, let's see. So at the, at the same distance, you'd be more likely, if you were conditional on moving a certain distance, you'd be more likely to move to here than to here. And then we add a little bit more complication in that because um, there's right off the bat, 
have uh, sex-specific dispersal. Um, so male bears move further than female bears. And so we made the uh, equation a little bit more complicated to account for that. Um, it's basically another linear regression, but on sigma. And then the likelihood just is that basically we're taking a discrete version of it and we're taking the, the likelihood of dispersing to the actual place it dispersed to and comparing that to the all possible locations that it could have dispersed to. So that's a pretty, um, with a lot of spatial kinds of questions, if you're able to figure out a discrete landscape, uh, then you can use this approach to simplify problems. And then of course, this is just one individual, but you'd multiply that across all the individuals that are in your data set. So this method's published in my Peak Ecology, um, and I'm excited to apply it to our new current agent office. Um, this is just a little bit about what I want to do in terms of the next steps for the model. So I talked a little bit about using different landscape uh, layers. Um, we're also interested in thinking about the likelihood of, of actually dispersing at all. Um, and so we have, we have a lot of information in the system, so that's kind of nice. Um, it allows us to look at uh, things like just relatedness and, and good habitat and density. Um, so we'll have a part of the model that will be about departure, a part of the model that will be about actually setting, settling in a particular place, as well as these things that have already worked with the transient and uh, individual trait. Uh, this is just a, this was a preliminary data set that I, that I worked up um, where we had 109 male dispersals, 106 female dispersals, and we estimated the variance of the dispersal curve, um, in this case at, for males, 23.5 kilometers, and we're in here, that's the, basically the average um, in this particular equation, and 5.9 for females. And so you can see um, that at that level, it's at least realistic. We know uh, males disperse much further than females. And we can also describe that as a curve that describes the cost distance. So again, these are weighted basically by the landscape then. Looks pretty similar, but it's shifted a little bit. And from this approach, then, we get actual resistance estimates that also have confidence intervals around them, um, which allows you to look directly at the sensitivity of your choices in terms of corridor development. Um, and this is just a, this is um, not going to be the final version by any means, but um, I was happy to see it was consistent with our expectations, at least that road density had higher resistance and things like good habitat had really low resistance. Um, and from that, this is just, again, one version. So, so what I'll do in the final version is do a, a, an aki uh criteria comparison of, of many different model hypotheses. Um, but this is just one to sort of illustrate what you do then. So then you have, this is the resistance surface from that particular model fit. And if I wanted then to apply this going out east of here, again, I'm, I'm extrapolating, so I'm still making assumptions, but I know what they are at least. Um, I'm assuming that whatever influence bears in this system is also be influencing them outside of the system. And you can loop across there or go down to Yellowstone or to Bitterroots, um, wherever you prefer. So, um, and I guess one of the things that I was happy to see is it did show whitefish as a uh, problem area for, for bears to disperse through or to. Um, there's a pretty high mortality, local, little local mortality spot there because uh, of garbage that people don't um, take care of properly. So, all right, so yeah, so currently we're rerunning this with the updated and additional genotypes and expanding the model to include those other components. So, I mean, this, this approach, um, it works for me for these bears, um, but I recognize it's not ideal for everyone either. Um, so again, it's, it's simpler because it's only two processes. It's just survival and movement, you know, with dispersal movement specifically. Um, so it's more directly targeting the processes that we might be interested in in terms of uh, dispersal and planning for, for corridors. 
Um, but, you know, this is a super expensive project. Um, we have that luxury of having that kind of data. You may or may not have that for your systems. Um, and so that's um, something to consider for sure. So you might not have this kind of data. Um, yeah, and so, um, I don't know, I think <laughs> the, the optimization approach and sort of the more traditional landscape genetics approaches, I mean, what I saw is that if you have really strong variables that you pretty much know influence movement anyway, they're still going to be identified and come out as influencing movement, and you can put a number on them. The number may or may not be very precise, but it still might be a better way to <coughs> move forward with, with planning a corridor and implementing management on the ground than doing nothing. Um, there's also some thoughts that, uh, so I think part of why it was often those approaches didn't end up being all that uh, great in terms of getting the, the right resistance values back had to do with um, local drift going on. And so we think about local drift happening at the population level, but probably when you have just these concentrations of individuals and different levels of gene flow between them, um, that's influencing it too. So you, you have a barrier uh, and you have a relatively small group of individuals um, that's going to, that could potentially have some small localized drift over short time scales. And it could get wiped out, but that's going to add stochasticity into your, um, into the process that you're trying to measure. Um, yeah. So a couple other things. All of these are still correlations. And so we're, we're kind of stuck with that doing ecological work and applied work. Um, just do our best. Um, so two ways you can kind of think about trying to deal with that is trying to assess model in a certain some way. So part of why I like the parentage approach is it, it gives me confidence intervals. Um, most of the other approaches don't, but that doesn't mean um, there's not a, a way of assessing uncertainty. So you, have, you might have to be creative, but um, you can do things like leaving, uh, leaving one out, doing some sort of cross-validation or leaving 20% of your data set out. Um, you can do things to compare your assumptions about how animals perceive the landscape. So again, that's um, somebody was mentioning the circuit theory approach versus least cross path. Those are kind of two different hypotheses about how animals perceive the landscape. You could look at different statistical tests. Um, Stop and Hall wrote about that. You can compare genetic distance and gene flow estimators, different types. Um, Oh yeah, and Brian put this in, and I, and I agree with them, that automated searches, if you can figure out a way to automate it, you definitely should do it. And so work with a computer scientist that, or um, develop the skills yourself to, to do that, because it's uh, a lot faster once you get it figured out. So just one um, thing about cross-validation. So basically all it is, is is partitioning your data into complementary subsets, and you do analysis on one subset, and then validate it with another subset. Depending on what kind of data set you have, you'll have to identify the best, what you're trying to leave one out on. Um, and basically that's just doing, it's basically allowing you to check to see that your results don't change greatly based on your sample design um, and what you've, what you've actually sampled. So that's one way to kind of improve your confidence in results. Um, you can also use a second data source, which I think is, is uh, the best way to go if you, if you can possibly do it. Again, you might, this might be more expensive, but it really, um, if you're making big management decisions on the basis of um, just one kind of data, um, even if it's just a little bit of data, you usually feel a little bit better about it. Kind of have the, have the, um, <coughs> the initial test reinforce a little bit of what uh, Richard was talking about. And finally, um, Again, your sampling really matters. So this is a study um, that um, several folks were involved with, including Gordon and, and Mike Schwartz and Fred Elmdor, um, but basically it's a black bear study and they looked at several different populations. And in some populations, uh, when, they were, when they were trying to calculate resistances, um, they found that some things didn't matter and that probably because it wasn't, uh, <coughs> if, if it was all a forest type for black bears, black bears like forest, um, then, you know, there's, it's not an important variable because there's no variation 
in where you're sampling. So just keep the variability of whatever you're sampling in mind and that something might be important if it's not, if you're not sampling it, you can't tell whether it's important or not. All right, that's, that's all I had for present presentation material. Um, do you guys want to talk more about any of those pieces or, or anything? How many of you have an antique genetic database? Cool. How many of you have started to play with it? Quite a lot. That's good. What other approaches are you guys using? Uh, I use them. Um, email in the regression work. Uh huh. I have the same thing you know, like with the like you do and the address for um some parameters like temperature and lava connectivity. Yep. And like it's not six stage in them. Uh huh. And then I did a partial LBA. Uh huh. So it suggests it that which temperature was the best to resolve my genetic variation. Yep. And uh, then I did a splash out C on our fire also to detect um so it's a polygenic effect. Yeah. Oh. Selection maximum <laughs> the temperature. Yeah, very cool. And so, what species were you working with? Uh, I'm making lobster. Lobster. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And did, was there an effect? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not surprised. <laughs> yeah. It's like from Newfoundland to uh, Rhode Island, so it's kind of a big range and a lot of variability for temperature also. So. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Any other um, approaches that people are using? I think it's called similar approach to mm -hmm. But um, I actually did it on an individual base. I'm working on caribou. And caribou? Yeah. Uh -huh. well, I didn't do, I didn't follow like per state approach, which usually this is what people are doing. I just did all my analysis based on every individual. And I also check on relatedness. Mm -hmm. So you incorporate relatedness as a potential explanation? Yeah. Well, I, I, I would like to have my own other set, so someone else is generating that so that another people would do it. Plus, there's division risk. Uh -huh. So, and yeah, it was in a, in a small area, so that's why I, I have the issue with the statistics. Yeah, there's maybe a mismatch in the <coughs> data and the scale of analysis, you know, scale of analysis. I mean, it, it, in small areas, it, I didn't find any. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the animal caribou maybe don't see yeah. that as a issue. This, yeah, they can they can jump over the tables. Yeah, yeah, there's a sea baby. Cool. Well, I th yeah, I mean, I think this field's still rapidly developing, and I think um, you know, I mean, I think one of the cool things about genomic data specifically is that when it comes to you know these these multiple complicated processes you know at that point you really have a richer data source and so you can really actually start to model more of those processes and start to pull that apart you know whereas with you know 24 microsatellite foci we just don't have you don't have that power um, and so I think there's going to be I'm, I'm anticipating that there'll be a lot of um, further developments in that area particularly with genomics um, and particularly when people really kind of, you know, sort of think about those processes and how they would actually um, influence different parts of the genome, especially. So, so I think there's still a lot of uh, development that's going to happen. I think it's cool that people have gotten as far as they have gone, but I think there's still a really long ways to go. So um, I'm excited about that. I think it's fun. So. Is anyone doing a landscape genomics study? Okay. Yeah, so I mean the reason I'm thinking about the genomic approach is because I'm working in single coalitions or others with my island and I have great coverage of the animals. Um, <coughs> yet, um, you need that kind of scale resolution with the data to, to look at resistance in a small landscape. So if your landscape is small, then you need more loci. Yes, like unless it's a really power, but single coalitions don't have any major obvious ecological. Theory, which is like a mountain or elevation gradient. So I'm actually looking at the urban element and the cascade and edge species. So looking around at habitat versus two contiguous forests and then taking both the urban areas. Well, that 
landscape genetics with lots of blood Um, it, To start out with, it's definitely, I would say, to start out with. So you're not looking for adaptive <laughs> not at this point. Yeah. Yeah. But in the lobster, did you look for? Yeah, it's why it's, it's more like with the, I'd say, we did an approach like a natural form and an adaptive form. So we just uh, took all the category neutral loci and look for in the larval connectivity, how much genetic variation in a neutral loci are explained by larval connectivity or geographic distance or temperature. Mm -hmm. um, because temperature can also have an important impact on the gene flow and the movements of the lobster. So we did this approach and we found that temperature has a huge impact as well in the larval connectivity. But at the same time, what is cool with that is that you can do also adaptive uh, you can look for adaptive variation and how it's linked with the with the variables like temperature. So I did neutral part and on the adaptive part I did like a LDA, which I, I think is a very great tool that well maybe uh, before we get used more to use it. It's like mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a PCA but on the environmental like on your temperature for instance and on your genetic variation and, and try after to just when you put the matrix, uh, the, the PCA value together, how well it fits, and so you can figure out if like how many percent of the genetic variation are explained by this temperature instead of this one. So what I did is like I had seven type of temperature. Mm -hmm. As you like, I mean, it's, it's it's very difficult to find which parameters has its strong impact compared to the other. You know, so like uh, I just for several temperature and. I found like with the LDA, LDA you can find which which is the best predictor for your for your variation. So I found temperature was a, like minimum temperature. And then after I I I just made like um from slash out we see on outliers and move to temperature instead of like linking to latitude and longitude to see if the signal that I have at several mm -hmm. side was more linked to temperature than to geographical distance or to remove the impact of also geography because that latitude is so correlated with temperature. So it's why partial LDA is great or partial monitor test. Like it's to remove the impact of and the difference though is in dependency analysis if you use your identifying environmental variables that explain the patterns of genetic variation if you're observing the head, for example, with the spatial analysis that you did, you can actually identify where on the landscape things are happening. So yeah, it's like it's it's two different approach, but like yeah. with the special PCA, what is cool is like you make a climb and you can see where the climb is, you know, like where is a strong uh, and approach, like a where the slope is great. Yeah, exactly, and yeah. the slope. And but if you wanted to identify the barriers to gene flow or something on the landscape, you mm have -hmm. to go and do the spatial Well, just identifying barriers, just identifying barriers, there's a whole set of approaches <coughs> specifically for that too, but some of them are looking basically, it's, there's an approach called modeling, for instance, that, that does something very similar to that, where it's looking for where is the greatest change um, between, you know, what was that word? Well, modeling. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a fun word, but, but um, yeah, so, but again, you know, it's, it's sort of, like really all of these are, are approaches where you're looking at, you're looking at the pattern and inferring the process versus actually modeling the process of, you know, we think this is happening during the mating movement to mate. This is what we think is happening, you know, as inheritance happens. This is what we think is happening as dispersal happens. And so, um, you know, it, again, it's a start. It's a great start. You've got to start somewhere, right? Um, I mean, these are issues now. You know, we can't, we can't wait to have the 